micromanagement is not scalable. And it's true. If you don't have people capable of independent action and effective action, then the organization can't develop and grow, which means nobody gets to grow within it. Welcome to Encouraging Leaders, a podcast that exists to remind CEOs and aspiring CEOs that they're not alone. I'm Mark DeBron, and today we're joined by somebody who has breathed courage into me and so many people around the world. Stan Seawich. He has been the Vice President of Organizational Development for WD40 for nine years um, and has spent 14 years uh, consulting with that organization. Uh, as you know, WD40, we talk about a few times, uh, one of the most world-class engagement engines. He's also a board of director for 13 companies over the last three decades. He's an author and a thought leader. His most recent book, Engage, I got to read and just talks about WD40's company and how it built the engine of positive culture. He's also a bassist and a blues harp player. Stan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. So Stan, I've been so excited to have you on the show. I, I ask every guest the same thing because I think that too many CEOs don't know that they, they don't have to lead alone. And uh, so I think about when in your life, in your leadership journey, did you realize that you didn't have to do everything alone? Well, it was a few years into the creation of my first business, uh, which was a consulting organization. We did a variety of services across the spectrum of organizational consulting. And I was the CEO, and I was doing it all by myself. And then I was introduced to a CEO circle, which I thought, yeah, maybe I'll learn something, maybe I won't. It would be a good way to market my company to other CEOs at the very least. So I went ahead and participated in it. And it really opened my eyes that when you're the CEO and, and the majority business owner and you have employees, you can't share everything with them. And you've got nobody you can really talk to. There's there's no, in my case, no board of directors other than myself and, and my wife. So this CEO roundtable was very important to my development as a business leader, just to share ideas with people in the same situation as I was, same perspective, same risks, same financial imperatives, same human challenges. It was uh, quite a, a turning point in my, my entrepreneurial life. Do you remember what year that was? What, how, how long back in your journey was that? Let's see, that was about 1995. I was at that point, five years, six years into my business adventures. I love the part of the story that says, you know, initially you thought, well, this will be a good place for me to gain clients. And then when you go get in, you realize that you needed so much more from them instead of just them needing you. Um, that's such a powerful example. I, um, YPO, Young Presidents Organization, is one of the organizations I'm heavily involved in. And, and they set up CEO forums, tight-knit groups that end up sharing the real things in leadership at, at a depth that most don't get into. And How did they structure it to where you could share openly real issues? Well, that's dependent upon the people in the group. The people will either be transparent or they won't. And if the group connects with each other and they feel safe and like there's value in the minds sitting around the table, then they'll open up. And if someone wasn't opening up, they would tend to leave the group and someone else would come in until we had a, a good, stable 10-person roundtable. The group naturally forms bonds by the level that they're willing to share. And, and if they're unwilling to share or if it's, if it's not safe for them to do so, they end up not being in the group. They decide to opt out. How have you seen that type of sharing back and forth inside of companies? I know that that's the president to president, but patterns have you done like in WD-40 to in engage or any of those patterns to get to sharing more and more openly with each other? Well, in my own companies, I had three businesses going at the same time for a while, a biotech company, a software business, and my consulting business. And there wasn't time to hide. So I had to be transparent with everyone in order to make progress. Not that I didn't want to be transparent, but it became not just a nice to have, it was an imperative. So that's how I, I was able to do three things at once to the degree I, I could. If I had it to do over again, I wouldn't do three companies at once. <laughs> but I had to be transparent in order to pragmatically make progress. 
Well, I think about, you know, you know out of necessity came invention. You mm-hmm. created uh, transparent communication for efficiency. That's what I'm hearing you say. That's right. That was the original purpose. And then what I learned later is that if everyone has the information, then they can make better decisions. And, and if they know where we're trying to go and what the, the priorities are. So that was also a, a great benefit. And then when I met WD-40 and Gary back in 2001, I immediately found a kindred soul in Gary. We had the same view of the purpose of business and how, how we wanted both performance but also higher quality of life. And so it was a great pleasure to get to know Gary and the other people at WD-40 for the next 11 years before he invited me to join the company. Yeah, I love that you find a kindred spirit that has been acting transparently also and trying to figure out that efficiency. And, you know, with 179 countries open, you know, you have to end up with efficient communications. There's a lot of CEOs that I um, know and I work with that are wrestling with that transparency discussion, like how much to share, when to share, what to share. And the other piece that feels uh, true is you you felt like that was ne- uh, out of necessity because of three companies running at the same time. I feel like with the world changing and the speed of communication changing, that it's almost become a necessity for everyone, even if they're running only one company. Well, everyone has a different viewpoint of what's necessary and what isn't. I, I still very routinely run into people, including uh, some of my current clients, who are quite hesitant to share that much. And especially, as you mentioned earlier, about compensation. And I think it's a false fear. What they're afraid of is that they either can't explain it well, they don't trust people to take the information and treat it with the respect and privacy it deserves, keeping it inside the company. They think that people can't understand how compensation decisions are made. They're not able or intelligent or experienced enough. And all of those, I think, are, are just smoke screens for the true fear, which is that they won't be able to explain how they've made compensation decisions in a way that others will understand. Yeah, let's go deeper there, because I, I got to hear you for an hour on compensation, and I just felt like you broke it down in such a clear way that I could understand it and then rebuild it and share it. Tell me how important it is to get clear about how you set compensation before you open up transparency. Well, and that's a good point. Uh, At WD-40, for example, they weren't transparent with compensation practices when I got there. And it took us three years to get to the point where we were right and able. Uh, It takes foundational work first. You have to be able to tell people what's expected of them. You have to be able to describe a role well enough to be able to see what the labor market comparators are. So you can have a market-based approach to compensation like any other thing that a company needs to buy. You have to educate your managers and leaders about the system and why the strategy is what it is so they can handle questions without the need to always send them to HR or somebody up the line. And so with that preparation then management becomes a little more comfortable being able to explain things if asked. And then when you open the kimono, it's a non-event. We had maybe three questions out of hundreds of employees on the system when the management had been just holed up and (laughs) concerned about how much they were going to be barraged with detailed questions of compensation, and it just didn't happen. We educated everyone well enough. You had done the groundwork, laid exactly. the ground foundations so that the uh, you know, market-based uh, compensation, you know, getting roles clear enough to define, that's what I'm hearing you say. You got to define the roles clear enough so that you can compare them across a market so that you can understand where your compensation is relative to other people that would pay them the same thing to do similar tasks. And right. if you don't have that foundation, then it's really hard to open it up because you don't know why you're paying what you're paying. Or you're using criteria that are not related to a meritocracy or to a labor market. It's yeah. relationships. It's my opinion as a leader. It's who's more valuable to me in my own mind as a leader. And, and that kind of subjectively based analysis of compensation is what causes people to distrust it. Yeah. And so to culture... If you don't trust how decisions are made about your own livelihood, 
how can you trust much else? It is interesting. Um, I came up from the operational <laughs> side and then in the sales side. And in sales compensation was where I really got involved with compensation deeply um, because their comp plans are normally, you know, there's there's a bigger chunk of their compensation that's variable. And so you end up needing to explain that over and over and over. And But then bringing that back in, I had to do that same foundational work at Cambridge, the foundational work of making sure that our roles were clear, making sure the job descriptions were adequate so that you could actually do a, a compensation across channels. And I think about how often when you go into a small company is compensation clearly defined and, and market-based when you go into a small privately held organization? Almost never. The part that I love, what, what you shared and what I hear in your share now is the foundational work is actually where the value is because you start to understand yourself, why, <laughs> where you stand and, and how you lead and how you want to articulate and how you want to value contribution. And then you mentioned trust. How can you trust anything if you can't trust that one? Is that where you would normally recommend starting? Not necessarily. Every organization is in a different place in their evolution as a business and as, as a group of leaders and also at a different place in whatever economic cycle their market and their industry is experiencing. So you might not be able to pay that much attention to it if you have existential threats in the business. There's a client I'm working with right now that is going through a functional and a market disruption. And if they stopped to do compensation exactly as I would normally recommend it, they would not be succeeding on the revenue generation and service quality side. So what I help them do is begin the process of compensation analysis and strategic design, and it's moving ahead, but at a slower pace than what it could be if they were able to spend full attention on it. And the good news is that they have a culture where leadership really respects and values people. So that has given them the ability and the latitude to not have to address the compensation system as thoroughly as they are going to need to do by this time next year. Well, I think there's a lot of our listeners actually in that boat. So they haven't addressed compensation yet, but they have deep respect for their people. And so they've got trust already uh, established right. culturally. And and what I hear there is is wise coaching. I, I want to talk about coaching for a minute. Uh, you coach CEOs now, is that correct? That's right. Yeah. With this client, you've seen that with coaching, it's not a one size fits all. It's not, I'm going to do compensation right now. And it doesn't matter what's important. You're able to guide them to the most important. That's what I hear you describing there with that client. Is that accurate? That's right. Right. Tell me about the role of coaching. You mentioned <laughs> the role of community, like building a group of people that can share deeply. How do you relate that to coaching? and the work that you do with CEOs or that you've had the chance to do WD-40 before you joined? Well, my philosophy of coaching might not be equivalent to, to others, so I'm not going to say this is uh, universally applicable. I believe coaching is to go where I'm invited, to address the topics that the client needs addressed, if I can, if I'm the right person to do it. And that means that I don't have a preconceived notion of where they need to come out on a topic. Mm -hmm. As long as their values are consistent with my own, then I'll continue to work with them. What I hear is opt in. You want both sides to say yes. Uh, they have to say yes, they're inviting you in. And you have to say yes, that the values alignment is there. Uh, you want it to be valuable to them. So you want them to actually be growing faster with your presence than without. As I used to say in my consulting business, I won't sell the same donut three times. <laughs> I love that. I won't sell the same donut three times. You know, it, it's a waste of human potential for you to sit with somebody and just comfort them. You know, there could be a codependency there that could be developing instead of actually a growth and challenge and let's move forward. That's um, right. I've had incredible consultants who act like coaches and coaches that act like consultants. So I, I, I'm not saying the word is uh, the same, but the idea is that we're only here if it makes sense and if the value can be generated and, and it needs to be valuable at the time that it's being delivered. It, like if it gets unvaluable for either of us, we need to be able to admit that and accept it and be okay. So for me, the acceleration of growth from a community of like-minded CEOs that I could go in and share my life with and they could share theirs and we could walk together, um, there was a certain level of growth acceleration from that. You know, it, it helped me. 
Um, but when I when I found the right coach for the period of time that I was growing, that that had the experiences and was able to walk alongside me, I always accelerated my growth. And whenever I would stagnate, I could feel that and be able to say, this isn't the time right now. It's, it's okay. I love that philosophy and it aligns completely with, with how I've seen it as well. WD-40 did something kind of unique. They ended up calling their managers coaches. What part of that do you see as, as helpful or, or not? Well, Gary, when uh, he was evolving as a leader, went back to school in USD, got his master's in executive leadership and was introduced to the Ken Blanchard companies because Ken and Margie had been co-creators of that MSEO program at USD. Ken had a philosophy called, don't mark my paper, help me get an A. And he believed as a university professor, you give the students all the answers to start with and then help them understand them. That's your job, is to show them how to get an A, not wait and see what they're able to do on their own. And Gary really liked that. So he brought that idea to WD-40, and then he and Ken ended up writing a book together called Helping People Win at Work, a business philosophy called uh, Don't Mark My Paper, Help Me Get an A. And so he said the proper role of, of a leader is to teach others, like an elder in a tribe, which is another concept that Gary brought to WD-40. That's, in truth, what I found in my own world and my own life was the most important thing a leader could do for me is to help me develop and grow. And I had some great mentors along my path. So once again, he and I were quite aligned. And that terminology helped to reinforce the mindset in the leaders in the company. It said coach on the performance appraisal form, first coach, second coach. That's where you sign. And the, the appraisal process was about helping a person develop and grow in the future, not just marking what they did in the past. You you mentioned, you know, it's on the performance review, like this is your job. Coach one signs here, coach two signs here. How critical is it to know that that is part of your role as a leader? Well, it's, it's not only critical to know it, it's critical to believe it. If you're in an organization, we had some people in, in WD-40 who accepted the terminology, but they didn't accept the substance of the challenge to be a coach. And it takes a lot of attention. If you're a coach, you're always watching. You're always taking in information. You're figuring out how to positively enforce progress in this direction and when to give corrective guidance in a way that doesn't demoralize someone but encourages them. It's a lot of attention and intentionality, which doesn't take more time, but it takes more of your mind and your awareness. And I think that's one of the reasons why more people don't do it and don't do it well. You said something there. You said it doesn't take more time, but it takes more attention. Um, right. I think a lot of people I hear uh, making <laughs> the statement that they don't have time to coach. You're saying it doesn't take more time. I've found it doesn't take more time. Why doesn't it take more time? The fallacy is that you have to stop doing this and start doing that. I've got to stop leading and start coaching when, in fact, They have to be done at the same time to be effective. I I think about many times people hear coaching and they think it's only asking questions, like open-ended questions. And I'm like, no, you actually sometimes have to show the actual process so that they can see it and modeling that. And then you are walking them up the steps in that story. You're you're letting them take on more and you take on less. And then ultimately, long-term, you're observing them and then observing nothing. You're not there. I think about that final state, which is um, when they're fully empowered, fully capable of doing the work that you were doing at one point in time, and you're now not having to be there for them to be successful. Tell me about the time savings side of that coaching model. You know, that the fact that you aren't even there and and it's getting accomplished. Um, That's the that's the end goal. Well, it's the only way to grow. As, as Gary often says, micromanagement is not scalable. And it's true. If you don't have people capable of independent action and effective action, then the organization can't develop and grow, which means nobody gets to grow within it. Yeah. And so that statement of being able to coach yourself out of the role so that somebody else is doing it competently now, they're, also, they're setting up the meeting, they're actually delivering the content, they're they're asking somebody else to come alongside them instead of you That's go right. alongside them, right? And they're coaching and developing the next. That frees your time completely to now go and do the next roll up um, in that right. scenario. 
that's what you hope to be doing as you coach other people up to delegate the responsibilities. They may not do it exactly like you did, but they could do it quite well. So yeah. now what can you do that they can't do yet? And that's yeah. you, know, you should always be asking yourself in my view. Well, I, I love so much about that. You, you mentioned there were leaders that took on that role and they accepted the knowing part and also the full responsibility part of being a coach. But there's, there's organizations out there and leaders that don't know that that's part of their role. You've got a team and uh, you're leading them. And so you, you can accept the role or not. You can name it coaching or not, but that's your role. So how would you recommend to our listeners their first step? So they haven't had coaching in their life. They haven't thought of themselves as a coach. They're leading a business. They're a CEO. They're a CEO. So that they didn't sign up to be a coach. They've got people underneath them and they, they don't think of themselves as a good coach. They don't have the skill. They don't, they're not it. How would you suggest they get started? What would like? How would you get them thinking about that? Well, first of all, they won't be interested in what I have to say unless they're feeling some type of pain. If they're no no longer successful with command and control, authority-driven decision-making as their definition of a leader, if everything's working for them, and a lot of companies, they work fine for a period of time with that kind of approach. But if it's If they're not experiencing dysfunction or pain, then they're not going to be open to a different way. So first off, I'll ask them how the business is doing and what their challenges are. And typically, if they're honest with me, there are a number of challenges they'll be facing where a coaching approach would solve it for them. And then I try to explain why that is and how that is. And and some people will go, oh, now I get it. And I'm all in and I'm ready. Other people, it's it's too unlike what they've experienced so far, or they're more comfortable with just telling people what to do. It's a lot easier in one respect. It's it's simpler in the moment. It doesn't give you the results that you would be able to give otherwise. Yeah. But it is simpler in the moment. So until their their minds are open, they're not going to be interested. Yeah, there's so many times uh, I think through my uh, young leadership and also my leadership yesterday, mm-hmm. maybe, and how many times it's simpler to do it myself you know, cut the onions at home, it's simpler for me to dice them exactly the size that I want them if I do it myself. To coach and develop somebody into the person who can do it it takes longer. That's what my my brain is telling me in the moment when I'm cutting onions or doing something simple at work. And uh, over time, I've I've learned that it's so much less effective if I do it myself than if I do it through others and help them develop into the person that can actually do it while I'm not there. And what you also learn is that just because you like your onions cut one centimeter square doesn't mean that's always the right way to do it. Well, my wife would tell you that I think that my onion size is pretty right. I mean, that's the, you know, our brains, I I don't know what it is, uh, but, you know, we think we're right. Um, How do you get over that part? Well, because I've been proven wrong enough times to realize that hmm, there isn't only one right way. There are multiple right ways. Yeah. And sometimes you invent something new if you allow yourself to not do it the same way you've always done it. That's where invention occurs, when disparate methods, ideas, or concepts collide. And instead of diced onions, you might get a whole new menu if you allow that creativity. Anything else you want to share with our audience? So they're young presidents. Their problems are all different, but they're all either growing too fast and quality suffering or they're growing too slowly and they want to grow faster. You know, it's all over the board on what challenges Mm -hmm. they're facing, but they're all facing challenges, as you know. What would you uh, recommend they they do? In the midst of that type of environment and, and stage in their life, I would ask them, what's the quality of your life right now? On a scale of one to 10, with 10 being you're ecstatic with the way things are going. And one being, it's about time to completely change your life because this path is demoralizing. If they're at a 10, then my next question is, where do you think everybody else is in your organization? And if they don't know, then I'd say go ask. Because you have to start thinking about quality of life, not just the financial metrics. If you're going to endure the difficult, challenging, long hours necessary to 
keep a business afloat, let alone grow. So you'd ask, you'd ask them to reflect on what's their current quality of life between a scale of one to 10. And if it's a 10, that's awesome. Start asking other people that same question in your right. organization and see, see where they're at. Because you've, if you're at a 10, you've got excess horsepower and readiness to be able to help others do that same work uh, to get and to a 10. they may be at a th- three or four or five. Well, if you are an aspiring CEO um, that you're looking at, how do I build and grow? And you'd love to have a conversation. would be happy to do that. Uh, you can find my contact information at encouragingleaders.com. Happy to spend 15 minutes with you and just see what's on your heart and see if we can help at all. Thanks again for listening. And Stan, thank you so much for joining us and our group. It's been my pleasure, Mark. It's good to see you again. It's good to see you too.